This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. So, um, seeing a presence of a quorum of the Amherst School Committee, I'm calling to order this meeting at 6.02 p.m. And we will start with a roll call attendance. Mr. Demling? Deming present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Lord? Lord present. Ms. Donald present. And I see it's a Ms. Present. Thank you. Great. Um, and we are, we also have joining us Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter. Um, and we are being live streamed on Amherst Media. Thank you. And, and also recorded. Our first item is public comment and we have a couple of voice messages. Oh, welcome uh, Ms. Sharkis. We have um, three voice messages and um, a few uh, emails. So I'll start with the voice message. It appears this one is uh, a blank. So I'll move on to the next one. My name is Nick Spire, and I'm an Amherst resident, Fort River parent. The latest partial reopening plan based on volunteer teacher returns has created starkly unequal outcomes with even whole schools being left out of the reopening process. This is fabulous news for the lucky few who get to go back, but it is a terrible outcome that was entirely foreseeable and had the additional negative outcome of forcing teachers to choose between their students and their union. This was a bad idea. That is entirely the consequence of our school committee choosing not to lead. Fortunately for Amherst students and families, other districts have shown leadership and forced the issue of metric-driven school closures before the Department of Labor, which concluded that such MOAs are not valid. So the ball seems to be squarely in the court of the school committee. As a parent, the school committee has given me zero reason for optimism. Even though you were elected to lead and serve the mission of our district, it seems like doing what's right for kids will only happen when it is the last possible option, and maybe not even then. So I'm hoping against all hope that now that there is a clear legal precedent for tossing the ruinous MOA, that maybe just maybe the school committee will finally do the right thing and put in place a plan to bring back all willing students as soon as possible and defer any further closure decision-making to appropriate, appropriate public health entities. To quote RSE Chair Allison McDonald from her op-ed in August of last year, which was six months ago, we have a moral obligation to provide the option of in-person education for students. It is up to the school committee now to show that those were not empty words. It isn't too late to do the right thing. Thank you. Dear school committee, my name is Renata Shepard, parent of second and third graders in Amherst. Given that Amherst School District is almost um, the only one fully closed in our area, I ask that you please bring all children who wish to be in person back to school by mid-March at the latest, based on scientific facts and the Labor Department's ruling on another district's MOA regarding metrics that are not legally binding. Spring is coming and students should have many outdoor opportunities for any type of learning, hands-on or otherwise, at all grade levels. Thank you. Are folks able to see this, the document? Great.
Um, that public uh, comment document, um, if it's not posted already, will be posted um, tomorrow on the Amherst School Committee agendas webpage. Um, I will now turn it over to Dr. Morris for a superintendent's update. As I've been saying often uh, lately, I'm going to try to be brief on these, and I think today I'll be successful. Um, so uh, just a couple of things. One is that um, the VA or Veterans Administration had a program that um, they have their own vaccine supply. In other words, they're this part of the federal government, not the state government. And so we did survey our staff to see if there were any uh, veterans, because um, they're opening the door for veterans who work in schools in any capacity to get vaccinated through the VA. Uh, we do have five veterans on our staff who wanted to get the vaccine and reached out to us and so sent that list in and hopefully those folks will hear from the Veterans Administration soon. But just thank Debbie Smorland for kind of organizing and shepherding that effort along and um, I just, you know, obviously vaccines is a big topic, but um, I thought it was it was um, kind of neat, and that's not information I'm usually privy to, who is a veteran in, in our, our faculty and staff, and um, so, you know, it was kind of like a variety of different roles um, uh, within our organization, had folks who have served in the military before, so um, just wanted to share that quick update. Um, just we, at this time of year, we have a school, uh, we do a like more full, all schools do a more full school attending report, and so we get a more um, up-to-date data. And so at the Amherst Elementary level, our number of homeschool students last year was 16, and this year, right now, is 48. So you could see that's a threefold increase in homeschool students. Private school enrollment went from 60 to 89, so that's up, you know, about half, about 50% increase in private school students, um, and many of those are in kindergarten. Um, there's more private school kindergarten students. There's more than twice, the, or about twice the number of any other grade level. Um, is in kindergarten. So just one of the things to note, I know we're going to talk about budget later today. One of the very challenging items is to, to be able to predict what the enrollment will look like next year. Um, you know, it's, you know, we don't know what choices families will make, either families who opted to homeschool or families who opted to um, have their kids in private school or stay in a private preschool, even though they're kindergarten age, uh, because it was in person, which we had a fair number of. So uh, I just want to add that to the complications as we think about budgeting next year as, as we expect some differences in enrollments and we don't exactly know what those patterns will be, especially next year's first grade. Uh, we anticipate a, a pretty significant shift because that seems like the most volatile number. Um, uh, two more updates and that's it. So the federal government this week indicated that they will not be uh, allowing states to um, uh, they will be mandating that the MCAS requirement of giving standardized tests uh, needs to still take place this spring. Um, they did offer flexibility for perhaps students to take it at home if they so choose to. But, you know, every briefing I had from DESE is they were waiting on the federal government to sort of make a determination of what they were doing with MCAS uh, before they kind of finalized their plan. And uh, there's not supposed to be consequences for individual students nor school from the standardized tests, uh, from what I understand from the federal government. Uh, I have a briefing later this week with the DESE, so I imagine we'll hear more on that. But since it was widely reported yesterday, uh, wanted to share that. And something that's been widely reported today as my last update is Commissioner Riley this morning and then in a press conference this afternoon. I did not watch the board meeting this morning, um, but I did see much of the press conference this afternoon, not all of it, um, indicated that um, he uh, plans to bring a proposal in March to the Board of Sec Elementary and Secondary Education to amend regulations around um, learning models and time on learning um, to give him the authority to determine when the hybrid and remote learning models no longer account for learning hours. Uh, and more practically, what he spoke about is uh, ensuring that every district moves to a model that has in-person options uh, as close to full time as possible in the month of April um, across the Commonwealth. Um, so I had no notice, nor did other superintendents on this. So the only information I'm getting is the same information that anyone else who either watches meetings or reads the media reporting of the commissioner's statement and then the commissioner and governor's press conference this afternoon is getting. I likely will get more information as the week goes on. I'll be happy to share that back with the committee. 
as well as the community next week or the next public meeting. So um, certainly if you have questions, you can ask me them. I likely won't have answers. Um, you know, we did uh, meet briefly with the leadership team today just to go over basically what I shared here. Um, and um, that that's really all we know at this point. It's not been voted by the board of, you know, by this board of elementary and secondary education. Uh, it was discussed today by the commissioner, something he plans to bring uh, to the board. So, you know, all of our communication, if asked, is that at this point, no elected body has committed to this, um, but it's certainly something that will be, it sounds like will be brought to that body next month. And that is my update. Wow, you were brief. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> Mr. Harrington was watching, so I uh, wanted to make sure I, I got there. Um, questions uh, or comments? Ms. Spitzer. I just wanted to, to clarify, and I you preface this by saying you don't have more information, so I'm happy to get <laughs> I don't know answer, but just looking at the news article um, in the Globe today, it, it struck me that they're asking, it, it's just read to me like full time in person five days a week for elementary students. And even the, the, the most in-person plan we had, I just want to clarify, it was a hybrid model even so so do you have any clarity on when he says when what they're proposing and again i know it hasn't been voted on but are they proposing that it, it be the full day in person without because we were going to start a little bit later in order to give time for cleaning and, and um, professional development and all those things uh so it remains to be seen um he did mention that um districts that are fully remote might have a like a hybrid phase in um for what that might look like. So I think it remains to be seen exactly till I see what he's actually proposing in writing, not just orally. It's a little hard to note. Um, I think what I heard was stressing five days a week, perhaps not stressing as much exact hours, but I imagine if he's gonna produce time on learning standards around this, that the, that'll be in, that detail will be in whatever he proposes. I just want to clarify, I think the, the full-time uh, full was K through five. We don't know about six through 12 yet. Um, and as I recall, our phase one and phase two students would have been um, full-time. Is that, is my memory incorrect? So I think what Ms. Spitzer's referencing, and she can certainly correct me if I'm incorrect, is that you know the, the start of the school day was a bit later to allow for um, more cleaning time and more transition. And so it depends on your definition of what full-time is. You know, Technically, full-time for us would be an 8.45 start at the elementary, not a 9.45 start. Um, thereabouts, anyway. So um, I think we'll have to wait and see. Um, you know, I think you're highlighting an important point, which is said K to five. So I didn't hear any mention of preschool, which our preschool coordinator said, anyone talk about preschool, which, you know, unfortunately at, at often, this isn't a critique, it's just a reality. At state meetings, we rarely hear about preschool. It's situated between DESE and EEC, two governing bodies. And so it sort of doesn't always get the attention it deserves. And then it didn't reference sixth grade, uh, which in our district's elementary, but in other districts is not. Uh, most other districts is not. So I think um, I think that's an important point to highlight as well. But I think time will tell um, and we'll get more details. I'll be sharing them with you in the community when I receive them. Mr. Demling. Yeah, so I guess <laughs> I have a lot I'd love to say about this, but I, I'm just, I'm, I just want to be, you know, um, cognizant. This is a superintendent's update. So if I have, you know, like I just, I, I'm thinking about people tuning into this who have either watched the news about this update or you know we saw this other um item referenced on public comment it's been on social media and whatnot about a recent decision by the department of labor relations on um, um melrose which i won't opine on because it's not on the agenda <laughs> so um i just want to i just want to name for people tuning in who are hoping for a robust discussion and possible decisions and whatnot but we can't do it right now because it's not on the agenda um, I, I also would imagine, and Chair McDonald, you could probably clarify, um, and any of this stuff that might, and I'm not going to, I don't have any opinion on it, obviously, in this, any, anything that might have an impact to agreements we may have made, um, that would, th those impacts would first have to be discussed in executive session, um, 
Although I certainly think the more broad impact of what this means for in-person learning would be a, a proper item for open session. Like, uh, uh, I think we have a joint meeting next next Tuesday. Yeah, I think um, I would characterize it as a both and. Um, it, uh, we are we do have a joint um, meeting planned for the Amherst, Pelham, and Regional School Committees on Tuesday next week, and spring in-person planning updates and discussion will be on that agenda. It's not posted yet, so for folks watching at home, um, and any um, discussion that is, relates to um, negotiation strategy, bargaining strategy, or existing or pending agreements um, would be addressed first in, in executive session. So correct on both counts. Mr. Dimley. I'm happy to defer to anybody, but you thought you were gonna be short, Dr. Morris. I have, well, I have one comment and two questions on three different items. So yeah, the MCAS plan, the state's plan is ridiculous. They should not, we should not be enforcing an MCAS. It's going to be an absolute mess. And I don't know how you get consistent results that you, which is, which is, which is what you need trend, trending year to year. What we need is, is financial support from the state to address uh, the, the learning loss that we're going to have in this pandemic and include not just academic, uh, but the emotional supports. That's what, that's what they should be doing rather than focusing on let's knock off the MCAS. So really disappointed in the state's advocacy there, but you know, we'll, we'll do what we have to do. Um, so my two questions, one, so on the volunteer return, um, right? Um, so we, we voted that on January 12th and um, it, could, could you talk about the dates that, that we have currently planned for the, the students? I know it's only Crocker and Wildwood, um, but, but like some of the dates I've heard for Wildwood are, are kind of far out there in, in, further, I should say, further out there than we would hope for, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in March. Um, you know, it's been about 10 weeks since we've, we voted that, and um, that it would have been about 10 weeks when we get to the end of March. And um, I, I, I'm not, like, laying blame, but I'm just well, no. sort of echoing the frustration um, from some about, you know, about, you know, like, can you just talk about why that takes so long? Uh, sure. What kind of challenges you've encountered, and is there any, is there any possibility of, of speeding that up? Sure. So uh, I'll go over the dates first. So uh, we have preschool classes uh, as well as kindergarten and first grade classes, two at each grade level, opening at Crocker Farm next Monday, which is March 1st. Um, those are students who have already been to our school. So in terms of protocols and staff members who already worked in the building. So it's a much easier entry point for folks who have already done the work. Right. They, they know our systems. They know our protocols. Yes, it's been a while and we're giving them some space and time to, to prepare. Uh, of course, but it, it's students and staff who are already been in school working live with kids during COVID. Uh, we believe we'll be fine tuning this, but we believe we'll be adding um, uh, intermediate grade class on March 15th. We're going to be contacting families starting tomorrow about that at Crocker Farm. It also looks like we'll have some specialized program students, um, not from Crocker Farm, but from Fort River, but Fort River we're not planning to open because we don't have sufficient staff. Uh, also looking around that time uh, to be able to start um, on the Crocker Farm site, which is a familiar site because it's where our special ed summer school exists. So our students and staff are familiar with that, even though it's not their quote unquote home school. At Wildwood, it is gonna be looking more like March 25th. And part of that, we were thinking of a little bit earlier that week and we realized that there's, um, a significant professional development experience that our administrators and many staff members at Wildwood are participating in at the beginning of that week. Um, so it didn't seem to us wise to open when both of our administrators are gonna be at professional and a number of staff members are gonna be at a workshop for two days that week. Um, so that it did get pushed back a lot. It also, uh, because of the grade levels, it involves grade levels that were not in school in phase one. Um, so uh, there's, couple issues with that. One is that we want to make sure all the staff members, students, and families uh, have all the skills um, and information that they need to be able to be successful coming to school in, in current environment. Secondly, we um, are in the process of working out um, which students would return because as opposed to Crocker Farm, they're not ready-made classes of kindergarten or first graders who originally wanted to come in. Uh, this is involves um, getting in touch with many more families to identify which students we have seats for. Uh, and finally, because of that, we need about two weeks from when we get final student list to then get the bus list in time for transportation to redo routes to give it to five star to be able to do. So our timeline is essentially we need all the student information a solid two weeks before 
so that we can give it to transportation for routes to be done. So that was really easy for the Crocker Farm students and, and to a certain extent the preschool students because we already had those routes ready. Uh, that is not true for the building block students in the same way because they'd be going to a different site. Uh, it's also not true for the Wildwood students um, at almost every grade level that's planning to come back. An additional complication at Wildwood is uh, one of the grade levels that um, has staff willing to return is sixth grade. Sixth grade has a departmentalized model, uh, so they work as a team. So there's a lot more coordination that's required to figure out how that's going to work um, with a couple of teachers in and uh, not every, but not everyone. So uh, it's a little more complex than it is uh, when you have a main homeroom teacher uh, as opposed to a more dynamic teaching model. By dynamic, I mean it changes throughout the day who the teacher is. So uh, I know it's frustrating, you know, um, but you know, I want folks to know Nick um, and Allison over at Wildwood and everyone transportation facilities is, is working as fast as they can, but we can't, if we, we're not interested in trying to rush things uh, when we rush things, we make mistakes. And this is not a time where we feel like we could make it. And it, I know it's completely frustrating that it's a month from now that we'd be talking about uh, students returning to Wildwood. So I think both things can be true. And in this case, they are. And I apologize for the delay, but uh, folks are working and, and worked a ton last week going through uh, this information. And, you know, um, we're, we're, we're trying to get uh, staff and students in as quick as possible, knowing the logistical complications that come from it. Sorry, that was longer than my whole other part. So, but it was a good question and a complex answer. So, I apologize. Other uh, questions? Looking to see if um, Mr. Harrington or Ms. Lord have questions before we go back to Mr. Demley. No, Mr. Demley. Okay. Um, so, for communication to families who have left our district, so. Um, I've been surprised the last couple of weeks um, when talking to people in the public, um, how few people knew that we um, passed a motion, a very specific, I thought pretty strong motion, committing to our educational model for the fall, uh, which we got a ton of public input asking us to do, um, and that we are you know, committed to. And so and it, was, it was pretty clear that full-time in-person learning for the full year for all students provided health guidelines are adhered to, and that, that the decision that core educational decision um, that we've we've had um, legal counsel that this it, it will, will not be part of any MOA or or a future agreement, um, and so you know one challenge is the communication challenge to parents who are still in the district. But then there's those students that you you just mentioned, right, who have already left, particularly at the kindergarten level. Um, and so I'm wondering what what are our options, and and can we make it a priority, communications priority, you know because you have nothing else to do, Dr. Morris, right now and the rest of the year. It's like, to, just to get, just to let them know, not to lobby, right? But just, just to let people know what, what we have done. Like, I don't know if you have, and, and obviously the, the manner of automated communication gets a little more difficult when people leave the district, right? Um, but if there's a way to be able to reach out, I know we've done surveys in the past, so we must have some way of, of, of being able to, you know, reach out in a, some kind of a manner. You're muted. It, yeah, I got it. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I, I think the hard thing is uh, we have generally tried to not contact families who are currently attending other schools, even if we do have access to them. Um, just it, it's, it's, an, it's a little bit of a boundary kind of issue. If they're at a private school, you know, uh, we've, you know, and this is a conversation perhaps for, you know, that we could take up at another meeting because I think it's a meaty one. Uh, we've generally haven't gone, we've communicated, we've asked them questions about why they left or what would have kept them in. We haven't quote unquote advertised our offerings uh, by using, you know, former email lists or things like that when they're attending another school. I know schools do, I know charter schools do, right? Um, it's it's always been sort of a, a icky question, you know, that maybe we need to get uh, into a little bit more. I think the best thing, my advice to the committee uh, is the more it can be communicated out to our families, because I've been surprised to Mr. Demling's point, how many families within the district have not, are not aware of the vote that the school committee took and staff members, um, you know, so I think 
word of mouth will happen pretty quick once it's shared more widely. But, you know, um, all due respect to Scott and the work of the Gazette uh, and other people in the media, you know, we're in a media, media saturation time. And so not everybody, you know, kind of sees that. So, um, you know, it's certainly something that if the committee wanted to write a statement to me that we could put in a newsletter or something like that, that's just updating the community on a vote the committee took, that seems like something I could do. And I do think word of mouth, um, word of mouth kind of is like via text or Facebook or whatever these days, I suppose, but it still seems to be a pretty effective strategy once kind of a critical mass of people have a set of information that's accurate. Uh, that's my two cents, but I, I'm certainly open to a conversation on a broader outreach, but I, you know, I think we, we have not crossed that threshold in the past of kind of authentically advertising to families who have not, who are not attending our school. Any other questions? Not seeing any. Um, so uh, we'll move on. Um, chair's update. I was going to um, restate what Mr. Demling had stated about our um, our vote at our joint meeting a week ago um, to commit to reopening for in-person in learning full-time in the fall. And also I've, I've received questions from the community um, specifically related to our current MOA um, and, and, and also the Melrose decision that, um, that I um, described during that meeting last week. The current MOA does expire at the end of June of this year um, and it does not carry into, um, oh, sorry. Um, it does not carry into the next school year. So anything that's in that current MOA pertains only to this school year. And as um, we talked about last, last week and Mr. Demling referenced, um, a recent legal decision, um, a ruling, sorry, from the Department of Labor um, indicated that the decision on in-person versus remote education is a core education decision and as such cannot be um, part of any bargaining, uh, collective bargaining or negotiation. Um, so that's been a question that continues to, to come up, even if, if people are aware of the vote, um, then not sort of really being fully aware of the current MOA um, timeline, as well as the recent um, ruling. Uh, and we will be continuing that conversation, um, uh, as, as mentioned earlier, at our joint meeting next week as it pertains to this current school year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to and open it up for any school committee announcements from any of our um, members. Any announcements? Mr. Demling. I am reading a book. It is called, this is probably backwards to you. Can you read the, the letters? Yeah. Okay. It's called A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door. Um, this is a book called The Dismantling of Public Education and the Future of School by Jack Schneider and Jennifer Berkshire, two Massachusetts authors and education advocates. Uh, and they are hosting a uh, webinar, a, a discussion talk, one hour talk tomorrow night, Wednesday at 5.30. Uh, if anybody wants the link, you can just email me or Facebook message me. Uh, anyone on the, on the committee or the public, it's totally open. Um, and I, I bring it up right now because our plates are just overwhelmingly full <laughs> with, with stuff to take care of. And our focus is so much on uh, on the crisis immediately in front of us, and justifiably so, because it's a crisis and it needs tending to. Um, but, but one of the major themes of this book is that in the fight to protect public services like schools, uh, we are always, uh, to, to quote a famous musical, outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, outplanned. You know, it is, it is always a, a ragtag group of volunteers, uh, grassroots, that are fighting much larger, more organized, well-resourced, forces and they really lay out this big picture about what's been happening over the decades and over the years and, and how it really metastasized under uh, Betsy DeVos. Um, and I think when we, you know, charter schools is obviously a big part of it, um, but it's, it's, it's not the only part. Um, and um, so they, they do a really good job of, of highlighting that. And um, it, it's, it's part of our work and it's part of, of what the community can be paying attention to. And it can be inspiring when somebody really knows how to describe this. So. Um, Again, it's called A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door, 
Uh, the webinar tomorrow night at 5.30, hosted by Citizens for Public Schools. Email me or Facebook message me uh, if you want the link. Thanks. Thank you. Any other announcements? Not seeing any. Um, so we'll move on to our new and continuing business. And first up is our second quarter budget update. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter. I'll just hand this straight to Dr. Slaughter tonight. I think before you start speaking, just as a reminder for folks, because I know it gets really confusing um, in the community, um, this is the Amherst School Committee, which is our elementary schools. So we are looking at the budget, the Q2 budget update for our elementary school district in Amherst. So I've, uh, I've shared my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. If not, I can zoom in a bit more. Um, you know, the, uh, the picture on my presentation is quite small. So uh, if you could or not, if it's appropriately sized, if it's not, I will make it larger. But uh, if it seems okay in size, I, I want to focus. I mean, obviously there's some text there that you've had in your packet over the weekend, uh, but I'll spend more time talking about what's in the numerics uh, in the upper half. If you see me look up and it looks like I'm staring at the ceiling, it's just because the monitor I have is, is above my camera. Um, so uh, briefly, we're sitting at kind of where we were at the end of the first quarter as far as information. Uh, things are progressing you know, in a, in a similar way as they were earlier in the year. There's a lot of unknowns out there and, and I'll speak to those in a little bit, but uh, you know, uh, I think I'm cautiously, uh, I'll say optimistic about where we sit relative to our budget at the moment. Um, for example, our payroll is tracking uh, you know, below budget, which is expected. We have uh, some unfilled positions that we've held unfilled uh, in part because we're not in person, in part just to uh, preserve uh, resources because there are some uh, unknowns, you know, continuing to be uh, looming in our in our future that we're trying to, to keep an eye on. Um, and obviously our, our contracted services with staff or and our substitutes have been way down relative to our usual uh, application of those needs. And so uh, those create resources for us to utilize in other areas of our budget uh, later on. As we look at the expense accounts, most of those are tracking uh, as expected uh, and often well below budget because we've, uh, we've intentionally tried to be conservative with our spending. We've had a spending freeze for a while. Uh, that's by design that, that they are, are tracking below budget by and large. There's two areas that are highlighted in red, one of which is uh, in the uh, sort of district-wide special education area and the other is in facilities. Uh, and I'll, I'll speak to those in a moment, but but uh, the, the same thing I told you at the end of quarter one is true for both of those, uh, and that is that there's a lot of unknown in those. Um, the other areas of expense are tracking pretty well. You'll notice transportation is very, very low. Partly that's a billing issue. In other words, we, we get the bills from Five Star and we sort of spread those across. Uh, so those are lagging a bit. We haven't really hit the, the primary transportation cost, so that's tracking well below. Uh, you'll notice food service is basically um, uh, unspent completely. Uh, some of that will be uh, dependent upon what we uh, end up with as we go through the last quarter of the year and the last uh, two quarters really, but particularly the last quarter and how much in person we have as to whether or not we'll need to use our budget to support our food service program or not. Uh, I expect we will to some extent, maybe not the full amount that we have budgeted, but but nonetheless, uh, it is available to us. But but uh, those are a couple areas that are sort of striking in their, in their lack of use of budget. Um, but as we get into the the district wide special education and the and the uh, and the uh, facilities, what those two hold are the, are the a lot of the unknowns about what and how we proceed through the remainder of the year. Um, what you'll notice in in special education is there's a tremendous amount of money encumbered uh, in in anticipation of spending. <clears throat> uh, and so as we move through the year and as you know some of the things you were discussing earlier in the meeting uh, play out and whether we're in person or not in person, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, it'll change those needs, and it may lower the the need for those encumbered monies, or it may increase the need for those. And because of that, uh, and similarly, we have the same situation playing out in our in our facilities area uh, around things like uh, facilities hold much more of those sort of uh, PPE, hand sanitizer, those kinds of costs that are are sitting out there. Um, and there's a lot of unknown as even still with the supports we've gotten from the federal government. There's still some uh, process that we're going through relative to reimbursements. Um, so uh, the town is eligible for FEMA reimbursements. It's also eligible for CARES Act reimbursements, but it is a reimbursement process. So you have to apply and get you know, accepted or denied. 
And of course, with the change in administration, the rules have changed. So that's good news in some ways because there's more things that are being made eligible as well as a higher percentage of reimbursement uh, in the FEMA department. So, so some areas where that, that may help us, uh, quite frankly, but how those are playing out uh, is still being determined, you know, literally every day we're, we're spending more time uh, trying to chip away at those and getting clarity from, from our resources at the state and federal level relative to those supports. And so because of those being still unknown and hopefully in the next really few weeks, we'll be able to make some stronger decisions and stronger uh, understanding of what those, those potential costs are going to be as we play out through the year. Uh, we'll have greater clarity about what those two budget areas look like as, as we proceed. Uh, but, it, you know, they are certainly, you know, of concern and, and we're going to keep a very close eye on them. And, and there are some resources available to us from the federal government uh, that, that we can apply in the current year or preserve and try to apply in the next fiscal year. And so uh, we're trying to be conscientious about using that money wisely as we go ahead. Uh, but we'll keep a close eye on those two areas of the budget. Um, I think with that, I'll stop and just see if, if committee members have questions about anything specifically that I've mentioned or, or is in the document or not in the document. Any questions? Ms. Spitzer. Um, thanks for putting this together. I'm, I'm happy to see so much green, but um, I'm going to ask about some of the red. Um, so it, it sounds like from... from the facilities, that's where we potentially are going to be able to use the CARES Act funds. And so is this assuming, I'm just trying to get an understanding of the assumptions in this. Is this assuming to date we have had, I guess this is the problem when you look at expenses separate from revenues, but I, I guess would it change? I mean, so far have we received any reimbursement for the facilities costs or is that something where we're completely, you know, waiting to see or it, I, I guess I understand we need to be highly conservative and we don't want to, you know, count money that's not actually in our coffers, but it, is there any reason to be super pessimistic about getting that money and then with the with the special ed or the sped the district wide sped accounts my understanding is that you you're saying that some of the encumbered money we may not actually have to um spend depending on which um style of learning we end up with in the coming months now i'm can you make a statement of which would actually be better budgetarily um in person versus remote for that for that category. I'm assuming that the facilities costs will go up with in-person learning because it's related to PPE, but there's this potential for the CARES Act money coming in to help offset that cost. Of course, it's not gonna be reflected here because it's, it's a revenue stream and not an expense. Um, but with the, but the district-wide SPED, what would that go, can you say anything about which direction that'll go in with regard to which mode of learning we go to? Can I jump in there, Dr. Slaughter? Um, oh. So I think until we know what students are coming back, it's really hard question to answer. Okay. You know, so if, you know, even if the governor's proposal moves forward or the school committee decides to do whatever, you know, um, and not getting too far ahead of ourselves, what we still don't know, and the governor was clear, and I think the school committee likely would, would endorse the same view in, in any situation is that students who would want to stay remote this spring would have the opportunity to stay remote. And so I think it's, it's, that's why, you know, and I don't want to speak for Dr. Slaughter, but from my vantage point, that's why everything's so hypothetical and hard to know right now is if there is a change in mode, it's not going to be a change for 100% of everyone, uh, all of our students. And uh, particularly as it relates to some high need students, you know, we have some in, 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 the, in our schools right now in the distance learning center. We have others who, for a whole host of reasons, have indicated some real concern about coming into buildings. Um, sometimes that's related to disability, sometimes it's not. So it's a, it's a really hard one to judge and to make a decision on until we have clarity on who's coming in. Uh, if it was an all or nothing kind of thing, then I think we could probably do a pretty good job at it, um, but that's not our scenario. Dr. Slaughter, is there anything you want to add to that? But There's only a couple of little things I'll add to that. Uh, one is in, in, the, uh, in the sort of facilities realm, I think that, and, and actually in special education, both, uh, we have received some, some reimbursement that's covered some of the costs. There, there are 
large numbers of dollars that have not yet been determined whether or not they're eligible or ineligible. So they're sort of sitting, as an expense, they're also sort of sitting off the books as well. And so, you know, if you look at, at the facilities, it's at 76% and there's $42,000 or $43,000 that's encumbered. So, you know, it's not absurd to think that might kind of end up the year at sort of right at, at budget. But at the same time, there may be expenses that sort of show up that aren't there either. So both the question of revenue and the question of expenses kind of is lurking uh, in some respects there on, on both both counts. Um, so I will say that. I, th I think the other thing is, is um, uh, yeah, I think that how things play out um, over the ensuing weeks, and, and in some ways, we're going to have to make certain decisions by the end of this month from the standpoint of some of the federal resources that are available to us, we have to make some decisions about uh, whether we need to tap into those in fiscal 21, or can we push those off and try to leverage those most exclusively in fiscal 22 and 23. And so obviously, if we can kind of cover our costs with our, you know, with our existing resources and prolong the use of those federal monies for a later time period, um, we'd like to do that. Because um, some of those monies are eligible for some of those special education costs as well. I mean, some of it's, you know, sort of nuts and bolts, hand sanitizer, masks, that sort of thing counts. But some of it's actually for some of the services we need to, to support those students. And, and so uh, there are resources that are um, available. We're, we're sort of, uh, you know, trying to manage those as best we can. So it's, it's I, don't, I don't mean to be vague, but at the same time, it's, so there's a lot of open questions about, you know, some reimbursements in the sort of facility side of things will impact, well, what's left over that can be applied to, to some of the other areas as well. So it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, opaque uh, at the moment, and hopefully we'll get some clarity in the next four weeks or so. I have a question sort of staying on the question about CARES Act um, funding as well as expenses. Um, and forgive me if this is a, an obvious or dumb question, but I mean, we've, we've already spent more than that 125,000 for from CARES Act, right? The, the CARES Act spending isn't all reflected in these expenses. Is that correct? That's correct. There's a, there's a sort of large amount of other spending not showing here at all. This is really reflective of, of spending in, uh, in the appropriated budget, I guess is the best way to describe it. So the, the grant monies we have and, the, and that sort of roster of, of expenses, um, and I kind of hinted at this a, a moment ago as well, is, is are not either one sort of showing here, and that's not to be deceptive, it's just because it's, it is wholly separate from this. It, it will ultimately, before the end of the fiscal year, have to be, get resolved in some respects, and as we get into next fiscal year. Um, and so we're, we're trying to, you know, obviously leverage our, our existing revenues and, and sources of money as best we can to support the, the, the things that we have to support for our, for our students um, and, and trying to leverage the federal money to support those things that were just not on the books at all and, and will you know, still remain you know, open-ended as far as what our needs are going to be. So I said, oh, sorry, Dr. Morris. Um, so I, you know, said another way, because I, this might be, we, you know, people, we get the question a lot about sort of what about CARES Act funding? Why can't we use that to reduce it? So said another way, um, you know, the more, one, the more we, the more we spend that is reimbursable for CARES Act, then the more, the more funding we are able to, in theory, get. And this money exclusively reflects spending or expenses that we know we either we know we can't get CARES Act funding or FEMA funding for, or we're anticipating might not be reimbursable. Is that sort of a, a easier, a sort of a soundbitey way to to state that? Yeah, I, I would think so. That's probably the best sort of synopsis. You know, there are probably there are certainly some eligible expenses within what we're seeing here, but but I would say yeah, the lion's share are not ones that would be or not that we think are going to be eligible for those other funds. Um, so that that would be yeah an appropriate way to, to state that I think yeah I do think sorry Dr Morris but um, maybe at one of our next um, before our final um, sort of budget hearings or votes it would be helpful I think for the public to see just how much money we have gotten from CARES Act and and you know where that's where that's gone and and as well as FEMA funds and I forget the other. Um, uh, funding that we've been able to access for this COVID year. And I think that would be really 
helpful for the community and for the public and probably for us as the school committee to see just how much we've gotten on top of this appropriated funding. And, and we do have that compiled and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, I don't want to say scary. Uh, the numbers are large, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I guess that's, you know, whether they're scary or not is for personal interpretation, but, uh, you know, the number, you know, the amount of money we've spent on things has been pretty significant. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I think that there's some pretty significant resources that are coming our way and they're still not necessarily on our doorstep yet, but, but some of them are. And some of it's a matter of, you know, it's just got to go through the, the, the sausage grinder to get to us. I mean, that's part of it. It's just, it is a bit of a laborious process to go through the reimbursement process. So it, it's, uh, it's still in flux, but, but we do, and we are compiling that kind of information for you. So I'm happy to bring that back to the committee. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think to your, to your point, it's a large number. And I think, you know, a lot of times we get the question as if like, well, we could reduce this budget if only you did a better job getting more COVID funding or how can we get more, right? And I think like, just to show how much we really have gotten and how much we have already spent, um, I think will be um, illuminating for, for everyone. Dr. Morris, sorry. Um, not at all, and, and mine's still an offshoot, so I'm glad you kept that conversation. So just another thing, and it's an awkward one perhaps to talk about, but, but I think it is relevant, is that um, you know, with even the relatively small number as compared to the, the all students and all staff who are returning, um, we have um, some of the furloughs that were put in place have ended uh, as of actually today. Um, and so, you know, that's a good thing. You know, I said this when we talked about it the last time, furloughs are the, you know, among the least uh, positive things that, that an organization can do. It's not something we take lightly. Um, but, you know, I'm glad that as students and staff have started to come back, albeit in smaller, small numbers, um, you know, that we do have those staff members coming back and that, that does have a slightly negative impact on our salary line. And yet, you know, it's, it's one of the few times you'll say it's a negative impact on our salary line and I'm glad about it. Right. It's, it's a good thing. Um, so we do, we, not all the furloughs have ended, but, but a, a good, a good number of them have. And I think as more students come back, if more students come back in the future, uh, that'll be adjusted. It will have, uh, you know, it will have the negative, uh, impact on the salary line, but again, I, again, I think that's a good thing. And um, but I want to be explicit that some of the furloughs have have ended because of the return of the volunteer return of students and staff. And um, as more folks come in, we you know we would look to um, end them completely. Thank you, Mr. Demling. I see your hand. Yeah, I, I think from the school committee's point of view, we shouldn't feel awkward saying it at all. I think it's a tremendous thing that we are ending the furloughs for some of our really hardworking facility staff. Um, that that's a that is a tremendous side benefit of bringing students back, and and it's not that is not specifically the reason why we are bringing want to bring more students back to in person, obviously, but but that is a tremendous side benefit, and uh, we shouldn't be shy about about um, saying that in school committee. Um, I, I just didn't want to echo what Miss McDonald was saying about the kids. I think we we also get this I think legitimate question sometimes from town administrators of hey, we gave you all this CARES money, where the heck did it go, <laughs> right? And I think, and I actually don't think a large number is scary in this context. I think it's good to show that you gave us, um, you know, because part of it was, right, uh, good coordination between the town and the schools. Like there was, some of the stuff was given to the town, the town allowed it to be allocated for school expenses. And I think that's, that's a positive thing to be emphasizing of that kind of collaboration and that it was put to good use. So, and, you know, they, and they should see where their, their money went, or the money that they were um, authorized to control went, right? So I think that's good. Um, uh, I, yeah, you know, you know, just plus one about, I, I think um, when I see all the green, like um, it's good to see all the green, I agree with Ms. Spitzer. Um, and and I, I, don't, I don't want it to go past here without saying, you know, a lot of that is because of uh, uh, an admin team that is working really hard to keep expenses down and, and our staff that have endured a budget freeze for basically the entire year. Um, it's, it's not easy at any level of an organization to have a budget freeze where you just can't spend based on what you need. Uh, and, and those, a lot of those exp expenses continue even if you're in remote. So I wanted to thank our staff for that as well. The question I had was on the, Doug, on the, on the special ed. So I understand how these expenses can vary wildly year to year. And obviously we're hitting a, a high watermark uh, in recent history. Does the circuit breaker not help us at all in this scenario? Like, and so, and I don't know if you could maybe just do a, a very small description of what Circuit Breaker is for the public and for the committee, because it's one of those arcane things that 
in right. some years can have a really big impact on our budget. Right. So it tends to be a bit of a, uh, a lagging benefit to us, I guess, is one way to describe it, partly because um, uh, it just takes time for that to get resolved and sent to us. So just to sort of lay that out for folks as far as circuit breaker, if we have extraordinary costs in, in students' education, uh, we can apply for what's called circuit breaker funds. In other words, if we get above four times uh, the sort of statewide average for the cost of a student's education, uh, so if their expenses in by virtue of you know needs for support or uh, placement in in specialized programs or whatever exceeds four times the the sort of base that the state sets, that that's above the four times is eligible for reimbursement, and then is generally reimbursed at a at a percentage. It's not fully reimbursed. So um, you know the the district's on the hook for the first four four x, uh, and then what's above that is then eligible for 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 reimbursement and. So as we go through any given year, we uh, apply for and, and, and uh, are subsequently reimbursed for circuit breaker uh, funds. They typically arrive the following fiscal year, and so we tend to uh, put a one-year lag. So if we have a quick, you know, there, there are circuit breaker funds that can be used immediately. In other words, it can be applied for in, in, uh, in the same, and utilized in the same year, but it, it, we typically uh, have a one-year lag in that regard. Um, our circuit breaker uh, funds for, and you will see this when we look at the fiscal 22 budget, will will be in a, over $200,000 worth of support to the budget. Uh, it's a little smaller than that this year, but we certainly leverage those to help reduce that. That's actually already off the budgeted numbers. And essentially, we, we sort of take that off the top to start with, or those budget numbers would be even higher. Um, I will say, you know, as we as we look at this, that that uh, you know there there is application of, of school choice funds that are in the mix in this in this uh, uh, quarterly budget. There's some use of those we've applied, not all of them yet, because again we're going to apply school choice over the course of the full year, and so we're balancing the use of those in much the same way we are with with other funds like Circuit Breaker or or uh, uh, this you know the the COVID related monies that are coming in and helping us out as well. Um, so it's it's a uh, number of different pieces, but but we tend to have on circuit breaker a bit of, we tend to take a, a lag. So we, we have a solid dollar amount that we know exactly that we can then utilize for budgeting purposes. Why there's a, a lag of a year in our use of the money, um, and that's the longest we can hold it. Um, but it does tend to be a bit of a lagging uh, benefit to us in that regard. Any other questions? Not seeing any. I don't, I'm not seeing any, but um, I will also state. Oh, there it goes. The the um, the border of my Google Meet was covering half of everybody's faces. <laughs> so, I think we can move on. All right. All right. So cool. the um, I can cue the next one up a little bit more, which is the FY two preliminary budget. Uh, just to go over where we are in process, this is going to be a first glance at the budget. Uh, we'll come back probably in two weeks or so. I think that's right. Um, and we'll have the detailed budget, which will have adds cuts, and in this case, mostly cuts, unfortunately, uh, mostly reductions. Um, and we'll have a budget hearing at that point. Um, and then at the end of the month, uh, we'll be asking, you know, we'll get feedback from you, feedback from the community. Uh, at the end of the month, we'll be um, asking for a vote as Doug will go over. It's due to the town manager on April 1st. Uh, we intentionally um, started this process a little later this year, given the uncertainty of budgets, but also because with the new form of town government in Amherst, it gives us a little more of a window, a uh, couple of weeks, but that has helped actually. Um, so this is really the, the brief overview of where we're sitting and uh, the budget, as most people think of it, is is two weeks out where we get into more specific ads cuts. Um, but I'll tend to turn it over to Dr. Slaughter again. Thank you, Doug. Yes. So uh, just to remind everyone, hopefully, uh, this, is this large enough that everyone can see? Hopefully the print's large enough and it should be functional for folks. But but just to remind people of our general process, we start in October, quite frankly. You know, we basically finish one budget, take a deep breath, file some interview reports, and then start our next budget. Um, and so from October through January, we're, we're putting together the pieces as best we can find and, 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 and assimilate them. Um, and as we get into you know December and January, we get a little more feedback directly from the town as to what it can support, how much uh, you know uh, available resources are are there for us, uh, and we continue to to you know go through our meetings with our staff and and our our uh, administrators.
district team to to uh, try to shape that into a budget that makes some sense uh, for our coming fiscal year. Uh, then we'll you know we'll have this meeting tonight. We, we'll go into a budget hearing at our our next meeting. Um, and then the, the general process is basically starting in April, we need to have things to the, to the town of Amherst. And to be more specific to those, uh, to the specific timeline for the town itself, uh, by bar virtue of the, of the town charter, uh, we have to submit a proposed budget. So you have to vote on it and, and give it to the town by April 1. Uh, the manager has to then uh, include a full budget, uh, you know, which includes all the services of the town, not just the schools, by May 1 to the council. Um, and then they review it and they have to take action in, in June, essentially. So uh, this is the nitty gritty of, of what the superintendent was just speaking about as far as timelines concerned. But but essentially we have from now until the end of, of, of March to get everything uh, kind of buttoned up and, and prepared for, for submitting to the town for, for uh, review and approval. Um, so as we go into the budget, there's a few things I want to point out. Some of this is, is things you've kind of heard or haven't heard. Uh, but on, on the revenue front, we've gotten some guidance from the town. Um, I actually updated this number, this was last week with, with uh, the finance director. Uh, so the, the support from the town is, is about $320,000 uh, higher than the current year. Um, that's a little over 1.3%. And, and part of why, you know, the town-wide advice was one and a half, I think. Um, but we have a little less than that. It's generally related to the sort of cherry sheet and the, the impact of, of uh, of uh, charter assessments and tuitions uh, is sort of taken care of on the town side before it gets to us. Uh, and so that typically makes our, our percentage a little smaller than the, than the town-wide uh, other departments uh, in that regard. Uh, we have an expectation in this budget as of right now to use $700,000 for the school choice to support the budget. Um, to be perfectly honest, that's a deficit spending. In other words, the amount of revenue we're generating this year versus that number, uh, that's larger than what our revenue will be this year. Part of why we have a balance is so when times are tough, we have the ability to do this. Um, but obviously, if we get better news, it would be helpful to, to reduce that number if possible just to sustain our balance. But, but nonetheless, it's, we're looking at about a $700,000 support of our budget um, with, with school choice revenues. That's a little less than we used this year. This year, we, had, we have budgeted about $748,000, I think. Um, and the other thing I want to point out on the revenue front, and this gets back to our previous conversation, but largely the, the federal support related to the, the pandemic, uh, not exclusively, but a large portion of it is for things that are not typically in our budgets. So it's for things that we don't typically have, and, and it will continue to support our budgets in that way. And so it doesn't have, at, to date, I mean, there may be other stimulus that comes along that is more direct. Uh, here's a chunk of money, spend wisely, buy whatever you want with it. Um, that hasn't been the case to date. Most of it's been targeted to specific kinds of items that we're going to need and continue to need uh, as we go to the fiscal year. So I just want to remind people of that, that it's it's largely uh, been for things that we either wouldn't normally have need for or, or need more of than we normally would have by virtue of the pandemic. Um, on the expenses side, what I will lay out is that you know we've we've put in steps and and colas we've estimated for cola that's obviously up for uh, negotiation this year as our contracts all end on June 30th, um, so we've made an estimate of what we think that's going to be. Um, you know, from a health insurance standpoint, this is probably the best piece of news I've got overall in in tonight's presentation is that uh, our overall insurance is increasing 1.11 percent for the coming year, which is a very very modest increase. Uh, but there's also going to be what what is typically termed a health insurance premium holiday, which means uh, we just won't pay our premiums one month. Uh, and so that benefits our employees. They get to save their, their expense uh, of health insurance in that month. And then we will, uh, we will also uh, save that. And so that has really helped uh, support our budget and, and helps to, to mitigate uh, some of the other things we're seeing relative, relative to the budget. Um, but as, as you know, it has been noted in the current year, but also as will be, presented in this next slide after this one is our special education costs uh, are, are, you know, are increasing pretty significantly. We have uh, some, some students that have needs that, that require support from us and that, that uh, is reflected in our budget and is pushing it in, in a direction that, that requires uh, additional support from school choice and, and other resources that we have. And so I wanna point that out and we'll definitely use our circuit breaker money to help uh, mitigate that as best we can, but nonetheless, those, those costs are, are significant. Um, what this all boils down to is that as we sort of lay out those uh, increases in, in 
in uh, resources available to us and and expenses that are that are coming to us, uh, it's it's looking like we're going to need about five hundred sixteen thousand dollars worth of reductions to to sort of match uh, our expenses to our our uh, our revenues. Um, and so that's a that's a pretty sizable you know uh, cut series of cuts we're going to need to make. And and as you uh, see this last slide, uh, you can sort of see where the areas are that that have the most profound uh, impact to us. Um, you know, uh, salary of special education is notable. Uh, you know, uh, some utilities costs are going up a little bit. Uh, there's some areas that are that are holding pretty steady in utilities, but uh, the the water and sewer rates for the town of Amherst are going up pretty significantly, and that's got an impact on us. Um, uh, transportation costs are the modest increase that's uh, part of our contractual arrangement with with Five Star, and so uh, this lays out the the overall increase. It's about a three and a half percent is what we're you know across the entirety of the budget. Um, you know the the available resources from the town are are just over one point three percent, and so you know we've got a, a shortfall there that we have to to figure out over the ensuing couple of weeks, and 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 we'll we'll come back to you at the at the hearing and and articulate those in particular. Um, in the lower left, you can see the assumptions that are in here, most of which I've mentioned already. Um, you know the uh, the no sabbatical request is not a large number, but it, you know, every little bit helps. So we've 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 uh, already included that in our our uh, adjustment to uh, costs uh, for for the coming year. Um, so I think I will stop there and and see what questions people have and and uh, see if I can address those and and we'll go from there. Um, I'll I'll, I'll uh, the question in another. Um, district that we're all members of um, at the preliminary um, budget view we had an I mean looking at this where the increases are um, you know over half of that increase is coming just from salaries um, so when, with the size of things it, it looks to me that probably a lot of the non payroll account related increases are not things that we that are discretionary um, at this point. So I guess the question that I have is, is there any sort of starting estimate sort of at, at that other district, we started by saying, you know, up could be potentially that's the equivalent of 25 FTEs, for example, and the result is, is a little bit different than that. But I'm wondering if, if there's a similar sort of estimate of where we might need to look to make those reductions. Well, I mean, just as a rough, uh, you know, sort of metric, what we estimate when we have an open position, you know, if you divide that number into 516,000, it's roughly seven to eight FTE, if we were to absorb it entirely with people. Um, and I think that that's, you know, obviously, and, and the superintendent has spoken to this in, in other conversations, and he'll speak to it again, I think, in, in this regard, is that, you know, the, the goal in making any reductions like this are to uh, try to have the the least impact on students and their and their learning opportunities as we can, and and to uh, uh, make the least painful from the standpoint of what our primary mission is, which is to ed educate the children of Amherst. So that's the the direction we're going to head. Um, but it it has has happened in recent years. It's you know there's not a lot of fact. In some of those other areas, they'll get we'll get more refined with what we know, and so that will help us. and And I think as we play this out over the next couple of weeks, we'll we'll fine tune those those other areas of of the expenses as best we can, and and try to dial those in uh, as precisely as we can to avoid cuts to uh, that have a negative impact on the kids. Um, but nonetheless, it's a it's a pretty profound kind of uh, level of cuts, not as as significant as the as the regional school district, um, but pretty. Pretty large, nonetheless. Other questions from committee, Mr. Demling? Yeah, I don't have any questions, Doug, but I just have a comment that, like, I don't like this budget, and I'm not blaming you, but I'm just going to speak to the level of budget support um, about what we're doing over this over this three to four year period, and, and what we might have to do again in FY23, as we're all trying desperately to help young children recover from a pandemic academically, mentally, emotionally. Um, and Ms. Spitzer has talked about this at the very beginning of the year. We're going to need more than average, not less. You know, our teachers are going to be doing their darndest in this 
you know, this, this kaleidoscope of social services that our public schools provide for, for our families. Um, you know, it's, it's not just ABCs and one, two, threes, you know, it's, 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 it's the, it's the mental impact, the emotional impact. It's, it's the economic impact. It's, 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 um, you know, the disproportionately felt by our economically disadvantaged families and by our English language learners and our special educate. And, and so we're going to, knock it back to this degree it's it's wrong we shouldn't we shouldn't be doing this and when we look at it um in in, in this this uh the chart of what's happened in the previous fiscal years you know from 0 0.9 to 2 to 1.34 and then you think about next year so we don't have clear financial indication yet from i want to be clear I'm not, i don't want to put words in the mouth of the town manager or the fi town finance director but last week there was a presentation uh, about how they're going to fund the four capital projects which you know, I'm not going to talk about one way or the other here, because uh, it's not on the agenda. But one of the impacts is that in order to to do that with with hopefully one override, so you really have to increase the percentage of the town budget that's allocated to capital, right? And so it's it's eight and a half this year uh, proposed, and then looking at pot, and this is all like you know first pass, right? And they're not it's not final. I just want to repeat that endlessly. But it's eight and a half this year, and then ten the following year, and then ten and a half. But what that means, and and this is a serious enough possibility that they put it on a slide. We could have increases to the operational budget um, for FY23, so the year that follows this, of one or one and a half percent, right? So then you have four years in a row, 0 0.92, 1.34, and then one or one and a half that are, you know, average less than one and a half percent increase. And so we've knock, knocked back our level services year after year after year after year, precisely at the time when we shouldn't be doing it. And, and when I, bring up this 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 point about budget support I get a lot of hope for the Biden bailout and I, I hope it happens too, everybody but like that's not that's not a budget strategy that's not a responsible budget strategy in my opinion you know and so I I'm really concerned about this level of uh cut cut to our schools like I'm not laying it blame it Mr. Slaughter or Dr. Slaughter or Dr. Morris but um I just I just have to call it out in the history of what's happening uh, to our budgets and 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 the really, um, really uh, serious work that's going to have to happen when when all our kids come back in person. That's right. I think that that um, a couple of things. I mean, you know, the the dynamic that town and not to defend anything, but just to sort of paint the picture for folks who don't spend forever thinking about capital versus operating. But you know, you, you, the town is has uh, not built a building since it built the police station in 1991, I think. Uh, and so the, the sort of uh, drawback of that is that we are in a circumstance in the, in the town of Amherst where there's a number of large capital needs and uh, they're expensive. And so it, it, it makes it difficult to continue to fund operational budgets at the levels that, that people would want them to be at when, when the capital needs are as great as they are. Um, uh, so it's a dynamic that's very, very difficult, and, and those capital needs are are profound and, and real. And uh, you know, we even have a school building project that's part of that that conversation. I can tell you from walking those buildings, and we'll talk about capital a little bit. Uh, there's some serious need there, um, but I think also you know there are in some of the federal support that is in, in hand essentially uh, some supports around uh, mental health. There's some some that are expressly targeted. Uh, dollars that have to be used for that purpose, uh, and there's no, you know, it would be great to have more because it's it's not, uh, you know, large numbers, but it's the num nonetheless, there's been some acknowledgement there's going to be some need in those areas, and so as we, uh, again, think about those resources that sort of sit outside this budget that are going to be available to us to help support our, our work, um, you know, there are some that are targeted for some of those kinds of things, and again, those are, some of those needs are are present because we haven't been able to to be in a in a normal school, in a normal way. Um, that said, I think there's there's probably the needs probably far outstrip the the resources at this point, and so you know we're going to have to to be uh, creative to say the least. And we're also in a struggle because as as the superintendent spoke of much much earlier in the meeting, you know we're not sure how many kids are going to show up on the first day of school. I mean, as far as you know the actual uh, how many kids that went to homeschool this year and went to uh, a private school are going to return to our school district, and so we're you know, we're making decisions about class size and, and uh, staffing, you know, we're gonna go through that exercise. And yet, you know, we, we may find ourselves in a, in a bind uh, when, the, when the first day of school rolls around and the number of kids is, is decidedly different than what we planned for. Um, and of course, we've got, you know, uh, other kinds of, of 
of uh, programmatic, you know, question marks out there too, as far as you know uh, how that how school will happen next year. You know, um, in, in its in its you know depending on how the pandemic plays out over the next few months and what our options and available you know uh, practical, reasonable, rational things to do are relative to you know keeping kids safe and keeping our staff safe. So so there's a lot of unknowns still. Uh, that generally aren't going to be helping our budget, but nonetheless make it difficult to plan as fully as we'd like to. Um, but uh, I did want to mention there are some some specific resources tied to things like mental health and, and some of that. Um, and, and that'll be part of, as we go through and try to preserve money from this year to next, as far as what's available to us. Uh, you know, that so we can leverage those funds as best we can to, to support our students as they come back to, to being in our buildings on a regular basis. Other questions? Ms. Spitzer. Um, thank you for putting this together. I have a couple super technical questions and then some that broader kind of echoing what Mr. Mr. Dumbling said. So I'll start with the broader, which is again, I, I, I would like to just reiterate that I think it's just so incredibly frustrating to be put in a position where we're, we're hoping to bring back as many kids as want to be back um, in person in, in the fall. Um, and it's just, I don't see a way around it where it's going to be less expensive than it has been in the past. And I, I'm or we're going to need fewer people. I mean, I, I think there was a story on NPR tonight talking just about this exact thing, that if anything, we'd want to be increasing the number of teachers in order to decrease the classroom size, because COVID's going to be, you know, it's still going to be around. Hopefully the numbers will be low enough and we'll, we'll all have, um, the, you know, the vaccinations are out, but I, I don't think anybody's expecting everything to just go back to the way it was in 2018 or 2019. Um, so that being said, I. Um, I have a question. I'm sorry to keep harping on the CARES Act money, but one of the things I'm seeing, so Mike, you know, I've, um, is a lot of the public saying, why aren't you guys doing more outdoors? And, you know, looking at these models outdoors with, um, you know, I, I have two kids who are in person in, not, um, they're young, so they're in preschool and, and daycare, and they're spending so much time outdoors. Could any of that CARES Act money be caught? spent to increase our ability to do things outdoors like build more tents or potentially um you know get tables so folks can eat outside or things like that i'm just thinking i i know it seems they're going to be it's going to be so hard to pay for the things that we are normally doing that it's hard to think about spending extra on on creating um a more kind of pandemic friendly outdoor um, environment for our kids, but it seems like one of the things that um, keeps coming up. So I'm going to just say it here because it's, it's been on my mind. Um, and um, the other question I have is just, this is the highly technical one, um, is looking at the expense budget that you're presenting in the slides and then going back to what we were just looking at in terms of the fiscal year 2021 report. And it looks to me, and I just want to confirm this, that the big difference, if you look at like the bottom line in terms of expenses, is kind of the central administration lines aren't necessary in, in the, so the fiscal year 2021 one, if you, the expenses are, we're at like 12.8 million in the total expenses line, but if you go to the Fiscal year 22 projected, we're at 24.75 million. Is, so when we're doing the budgeting out, we're including things like the central administration and that, that those aren't being reflected in the budget that we were just looking at. And then, for example, like when I'm looking at special education, I'm seeing that we're at, we budgeted for fiscal year 21, $148,000. Um, but if you go down and look at where we're actually at in the fiscal year 21, what we're current, our current budget, it's actually up at 603. So if anything, we'd actually be potentially seeing a small reduction in what you're projecting for fiscal year 22 compared to what we're actually projecting to spend in this um, 
in this current fiscal year 21 school year? Right. Well, I'll take so, the first one because uh, they're okay. two really distinct ones. So we did okay. use some CARES Act money for tents. Um, I think we get, we have two problems in terms of scaling it. So like on an average, you know, like a wild, we do have 21 classrooms. There's not space or capacity for 21 900 square foot tents uh, to be put up outside. There's also challenges with technology and some of the use of that. So I think at the preschool, very young levels, I think it works a whole lot better. Um, as kids get older, it, it's a significantly larger challenge. Uh, it also taxes, if we're gonna put chairs and tables out there, we live in New England, it's gonna rain, it's gonna snow, it's gonna be windy. And so if we had massive amounts of tables and chairs, we'd have questions about cleaning. And I know we know more about COVID than we did in the fall, but we would, you know, presumably we're, we're trying to not have kids share materials as much as possible, especially outside their pod or class. So from a facilities end, it's hard to imagine recreating outdoor classrooms in New England um, that have all those things. So the short answer is we did use it for tents um, and thanks to facilities folks for their work. Uh, and once, you know, Lord knows in May when we don't have to worry about snow and some of the weather uh, in, in New England, we'll get them, you know, hopefully sooner than that, get uh, some of those back up. But in terms of scaling, um, you know, that that's a real challenge for us in terms of shared spaces, shared desks, shared chairs, um, the technology pieces that staff members uh, are utilizing. And I don't mean just that people have kids around the Chromebooks there, but you know, you think about kids who have intensive special needs and adaptive pieces. You also think about what we experienced in the fall, granted it was only a couple of days, uh, where kids with attentional challenges and sometimes the outdoor space is great and sometimes there's a lot of distractions um, and having walls matters. So I just think it's a longer conversation, Carrie, and I'm happy to put it on a school committee agenda um, you know, in the future, if you'd want, it sounds like we're gonna be talking about CARES Act. Uh, but I think at a broader level, you know, if we really are thinking of outdoor classrooms, we'd really wanna um, spend large amounts of money, uh, both on teacher training, uh, as well as on kind of different tools than what we currently have. Carrie? Can I, I just wanna say that I'm not anticipating like English outside. I'm thinking lunch, expand it like PE, right. maybe doing dance with music. You know, we're not gonna want kids singing indoors. Can we move the, the music? I mean, maybe we will, maybe we'll be in a world where it doesn't matter anymore, but I'm just thinking, I'm not saying history lessons outside because I, I, I recognize all of those limitations, but I think right now, like I'm just shocked at some of the days and I, maybe regulations where it's considered too cold to go out to play where, you know, kids in outside of the public school system are able to go outside and play if they're in like preschool or, you know, I, so I agree with you 100%. We were, I'm not pushing for that. I just think we might be able to push it a little bit further than where we are right now. And it could be really beneficial. Um, yeah if we can think of ways to do it creatively. Yeah, and just on that point, you know, kids did eat outside in the tents, you know, for the days that phase one started and we were there um, and adults as well, which is actually perhaps even as important or more important um, in terms of people's lunch breaks, uh, if they're able to be outside um, in terms of infection and concern. So, you know, we could definitely come back to that, but you had a long question for Doug, so I wanna give him an opportunity to jump in as well. Yeah, I'll just add just one addendum to that. I mean, I think, you know, the question is is whether the funds that are uh, you know sort of cares related eligible for use in that way absolutely and so I think it's just incumbent upon us to figure out which ways to spend them and in, in be the most beneficial in that regard um, as far as the other uh, couple of questions there I think that the 24 uh, so one thing is that on the uh, on the fiscal 21 quarterly report I subtotal and then have a grand total at the bottom so I think that the, the 24 749 on the fiscal 22 is a total, it includes the salaries, uh, which are over, you know, around 18 million. So you strike 18 million out of 24, you start to get what the actual sort of expense section is. That's sort of a unfortunate artifact of how that's laid out. Um, and so I, I can actually switch real quick. Hopefully that'll display properly. But this, um, this is spending to the midpoint of the year. So if you double that, that's gonna be $25 million roughly. Um, Sorry so, about that. Well, that's all right. It's kind of in the neighborhood. They're kind of in the neighborhood of each other, right? And but it's not always clear as to how how that stuff plays out. So that's 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 one piece. I think that um, to your other question regarding, I think it was a little more specific to special education and the fact that even though 
what we spent to date in fiscal 21 on special education is much higher than what we budgeted, but also it's higher than what we're, what we're budgeting in fiscal 22 is, is an expectation that yes, we'll probably do more uh, in-person schooling, kind of more like what we normally would do. And while uh, the needs of students are such that that, that number is up, uh, it also is reflective that we don't think we're going to be quite in the situation we've been in this year as far as the kind of services we're needing to provide. Uh, and if we are, then again, we'll leverage those, those CARES Act monies to, to cover those, uh, those expenses as best we can. Um, the other thing that is a bit of an artifact here is that I believe, and I could be mistaken so because I'm doing this from memory, is I think that our, our circuit breaker uh, revenues that were available to us in fiscal 21 may have been exclusively applied to to a sort of single line in the in the in the picture here, and and in and in uh, in 22, it may be more spread out over a couple of the lines because you know when you look at special education, student services, sports services, transportation, all of those kind of carry some of those costs that are circuit breaking eligible. I, I'd have to go back and look specifically where I sort of applied that that support. So I think that that also kind of makes it hard to do an apples to apples comparison a little bit, um, but. Uh, hopefully that, that kind of helps paint a little bit of why those things look a little out of balance with each other relative to like current year spending and, and projected and, uh, and budgeting for next year. Thank you. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong column. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Since this is um, only our first look and we're going to be coming back at this again um, in just a couple of weeks, I'm going to move us along so we uh, stay time. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Slaughter, for that um, presentation. Was there any more oh, on the budget? I think now we move to... No. Uh, we now move to our school choice hearing. So um, maybe I'll just cue this up in terms of the topic. If there were public comments specific to this, then we can accept them. Uh, but uh, we would generally have a school choice hearing, and it's an opportunity of the public if they'd like to weigh in specifically on school choice. Um, so it's kind of public comment, but it's queued up uh, right to this point in the meeting. Um, in the past, we have been, a for several years, been a school choice district in the town. Um, I'll make a recommendation uh, to the committee for your consideration and potential future vote. Um, but I'll pause to see if there was, I think I saw Ms. McDonald's shaking her head no, that there were not public comments for the hearing. So the, not. Yeah. the committee's okay. I just would like to make my recommendation and, and see if there's questions and then we can, you know, debate it more and then perhaps have a vote next, uh, next time. But the short story is I'd like to continue being a school choice district, um, particularly looking at kindergarten and first grade. For next year, it's likely the case that we'll be um, making school choice decisions a little bit later. Um, but as you can tell, we're relying on school choice pretty heavily and in fact, over relying on school choice. Uh, school choice students add a lot of value to our district as well. So we appreciate them and appreciate the interest in our district. Um, kindergarten last year, last couple of years, we've been really looking at kindergarten as a primary grade level to accept school choice students into. Um, I think the first grade is low this year. Uh, kindergarten is low this year. Next year's first grade. We don't know how many of those students will return uh, or not return. How many of those students will come to our district? Uh, they, most of them have not been part of our district at all. Uh, or if they were, they transitioned to private school pretty early in the year. And so I'd like to kind of, my recommendation is that we remain a school choice district. We accept school choice students um, well after our registration period and really primarily look at kindergarten and potentially first grade to fill empty seats, um, not to make new sections. So that's my recommendation. I'm happy to entertain any questions or comments now and know that we'll have an opportunity to come back to this before the committee has a vote. Any questions from, looks like we um, lost Mr. Harrington. Um, um. <coughs> no questions? Okay. okay. Um, we now move on to um, our the Comenantes, um enrollment policy, and this is yep. for um, uh, just to kick this off. This is a continuation of a discussion that we started early in January or middle of January, um, 
uh, we had received a um, question from um, and request from the from a current family um, in the Comenantes to relook at our sibling um, enrollment policy. Um, and we started that conversation, like I said, in January. And um, tonight we wanted to continue the conversation um, and potentially come to um, a decision on if, um, if we want to make a change. Yep, and um, so just to give a little bit of context, we are gonna be starting kindergarten registration in a little less than a month. Um, and uh, we anticipate our Comandante's lottery uh, taking place uh, sometime around, I think it's late April. Um, so this is timely, so we'll gather the feedback from the committee. I'll share that with Ms. Richardson and she will edit, um, potentially, depending on the conversation, revise the policy for your consideration at the next meeting. So uh, I think just to summarize where we are, um, the previous iteration, uh, first of all, siblings wasn't so much an issue first go round, right? There wasn't any siblings, even second go round wasn't so much an issue. But now that we're having students in, entering second grade, there's the potential for more siblings to participate. And the, and the question really is, how do we manage siblings who, uh, students of the current program who are not in the Fort River catchment area, monolingual English speakers who have siblings in the program? I think the other sibling parts of things is pretty well laid out, um, but there's we've gotten some public feedback on this particular point. Uh, I guess you know, talking to our team yesterday about this, our perspective is um, we are quite uh, committed to maintaining a 50/50 program and maintaining a high level of linguistic diversity within the program, and uh, for students with Spanish language backgrounds, maintaining that number. For the monolingual English speakers in the program, really the question is, how do we want to prioritize siblings from outside the Fort River catchment area with Fort River zoned students without a sibling? And I think that's the key point that we're looking for feedback on. We actually don't have a particular recommendation on this uh, topic. It, we see it as uh, we can make it work. Our, 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 our real focus is having the academic uh, backgrounds and skills and linguistic skills be balanced between the classes, um, you know, families at Fort River, and and we see that, uh, uh, and and we see that. Uh, uh, I don't know how to say this differently. We see that as a political uh, and a policy question, not so much an academic question, because from our perspective, uh, our 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 real main focus is the balance, the linguistic balance, not so much the catchment area. So. We're open to feedback from the committee, um, but I just wanted to highlight sort of the things that we feel quite serious about. We could see the pros and cons uh, of, of all the approach. We could see the impact potentially on, Crocker, on Fort River of, of having more students from other schools in it, but we also like the fact that siblings are part of the same program. We see the real benefit of having siblings be able to communicate multilingually in their homes, regardless of where they live logistically it's gonna be complicated anyway as the program matures and expands. Uh, and we have more and more students from Fort River and Crocker Farm. So, uh, I mean, from Wildwood and Crocker Farm attending Fort River. So uh, it, it's gonna be a problem regardless of however you feel about siblings that we'll have to you know, work out with transportation. So we don't feel like the logistically, uh, the implications should be a de defining factor. It's really just a, um, a question about um, how we think about this program and how it's situated within the community. So sorry to not come forward. Usually I come forward with a recommendation on this one. As long as it's not affecting the linguistic balance, uh, we're happy to roll with where the school committee wants to take us. Can I, um, I, I just ask a, a, a data question? Um, I know that one of the family, the fam, one of the families asked about the numbers of kids with siblings right now, but it's, um, another question that I had was. Um, how many, if any, are we of, of students are we turning away of, from the monolingual um, English uh, population? Sorry about that. Um, so uh, I can get the exact numbers for you, but I believe uh, both years that we've had the program, it's been in the in the neighborhood of ten. Um, and, um, and so, in other words, we have twenty. Uh, no total district wide students who are uh, monolingual English students who are would would like to be in the program, but what there weren't seats for. Uh, so in essence, there's 20 seats for roughly 20 seats for monolingual English speakers. 
Um, and each year we've had about uh, in the neighborhood of 30 interested um, families uh, for those 20 seats. I believe last year was actually 12 was the way, like the number of people who didn't get into the program with and who showed interest. Uh, but it's in, in the neighborhood of like 10, 11, 12, both years. And, sorry, I just, and about how many of those, how many students outside of monolingual English outside of the Fort River zone have we been able to bring into um, the program each year? It's pretty minimal. Uh, I want to say less than three both years or two or three both years. I shouldn't say less than three. I think one year was two, one year was three. So it's pretty small at the moment. Thank you. Ms. Spitzer? So I, I think just to follow up on the question the, that, that uh, Chair McDonald was saying is of those who were unable to be monolingual speakers who wanted to be in the program, I, my understanding is that they've they've all been outside of the Fort River catchment area. So have there been any Fort River students to date who were monolingual speakers who wanted to be in the program who were unable or was it exclusively folks who were um, zoned to Wildwood and Parker from? So here's the way it works. Um, so we, um, we have our registration in mid-March under typical year. About a month later, we do the lottery. Anyone at Fort River who's a monolingual speaker can have a seat based on our the current policy that was passed. Uh, there are Fort River students who've enrolled after the lottery has taken place who would have wanted a seat, but the seats were filled by students from Wildwood and Crocker Farm. So students who registered, quote unquote, uh, were able to register in the front, first month of registration, not on quote unquote, but just in that first month, uh, we have not turned anyone away, but there have been Fort River students who registered after the lottery who would have wanted to be in the in Comandante's program who have not been able to join the program. Are those included in that figure you gave, or were those only of the kids who were able to register in time? Okay, because yeah, that, yeah. that's tricky because if you move to the district late, or maybe your family's not on top of things in the way that they might hope to be, then you would miss out and you, we wouldn't necessarily be counting you in that figure you gave us earlier. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Um, we have not had a wait list. We've been able to fill all the um, seats with students with Spanish language background. We haven't had a waiting list. You know, we've been pretty successful at getting uh, the vast majority of students across the district with Spanish language background to be interested and enroll in the program, but we haven't overfilled. Uh, the demographics haven't shown because our numbers have been small the last two years in kindergarten in general. Uh, we haven't overfilled that number where we've had a wait list there as well. I know that wasn't what you were asking, but I think it's a relevant piece of data. Mr. Demling. Yeah, so I mean, I'll just give my two cents right now. Um, I, I tend to support um, allowing preference for siblings within language group. Um, I definitely concur with what Dr. Morris described um, that you know the primary consideration has to be not affecting the Spanish speaker balance. You know, just it's always good to remind ourselves that you know the one of the main drivers of this program is to address the achievement gap for um, Spanish speaking students where English is not their first language and um, and and just what an amazing um, opportunity it is given what the research says about about all the various different ways that you can um, you can approach English language and the dual language immersion is really um, has some incredible results in addition to being like uh, you know a, such a great cu cultural celebration for so many of our, our students and, and all the other benefits I won't go on. <laughs> um, but yes, but realizing that um, certainly within the language group is is you know requirement one, and that, and that's what we're talking about here. Um, you know, after that, um, I I do find the arguments that um, uh, that it that having two students in the same house, um, uh, immersing in that language increases immersion. I I find it, um, I find the the notion that families would be more invested and that you would decrease the chance of attrition. Um, I think those are, I think those sound like rational arguments to me. Um, it's true that if you have more students from one family, then overall you're decreasing the total number of families. 
although I, I don't really see, while I certainly want this program to be, you know, available to everybody, and we don't even have a lottery, everybody just gets in, yay. Um, you know, one of the goal of the program isn't to maximize the number of families in it, it's to have a successful program, right, and to have a full program. And um, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see, see a, a real downside to, to having multiple students from the, that same program. And I also, I'm also trying to think of it from the point of view of a family, um, you know, applying and then not knowing what's going to happen in a lottery X number of years from then, and then really having to make a decision. Because once you're committed, you, you know, you want to be committed. And so, um, and that can have obviously a big, a big impact. Um, now, it's not to say that we don't have families in that situation right now, where you might have kids at different buildings, right? I mean, I, I was, you know, it happened with my family. We had two, two of our kids at Crocker, one at Wildwood, and that's just, that's just the nature of the business sometimes with, with what we can make available. Um, so, um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's where, that's where I, I, I feel right now. Ms. Lichter? Can I ask if, if are we going to, is the intention tonight to have a vote because it just, um, or is it just to give guidance to Dr. Morris on how to draft the policy just because it's hard to vote when we don't have any hard documentation of what the policy is going to look like. Dr. Morris. Yeah, I'm sorry for not framing that well at the onset. So the idea is that if I get feedback from the committee that Ms. Richardson could adjust the policy if adjustments are required or requested rather so that you can consider the policy and vote at a future meeting. It was hard for us to know what to do because we didn't know the direction the committee wanted on this. So, you know, when Ms. Richards and I met, it was just like, should we revise the policy? I'm like, I don't know, right? You know, it, it, was, it was a little unclear because you all hadn't had the opportunity to have dialogue and give direction. So we're looking for that direction and we would bring back a policy for your consideration. But if there was consensus that like, yeah, we'd love to emphasize siblings within that band, Great, we'll adjust it. If there's not, then frankly, we'll bring back a very similar looking policy than what we've passed the last two years. But we wanted to get the school committee's input before we put together the final touches on the policy for next year. Does that help, Ms. Spitzer? Yeah, so I have some thoughts that I could contribute, but I, I don't want to hog if, if Mr. Harrington or, or Ms. McDonald want to provide some feedback since I already have had some time. So I, I actually I, I did I was <laughs> so, um, I I guess you know I'm I'm uh, I don't have super strong feelings I will just say I don't have like I um, could argue and and go either direction um, I it does make me um, pause in thinking that a you know the eldest child in a fort river zone family um rising into fort river may be locked out of the commandantes program simply because they don't have an older sibling that was already in the program and that that i'm going to say it doesn't feel fair at the same time that i know it doesn't feel fair that a sibling from um you know wildwood or crocker farm doesn't get that sort of um advantage and may be locked out so i just want to acknowledge that I think either way, no matter what we're doing, it's a lottery and there's going to be people that benefit from that and people that don't. Um, and so I think that's, that's where sort of, I'm sort of kind of torn as to which way to go. And I know when we talked before, we talked about that we don't afford the same sort of benefits to family, other families in the district that have their, their children going to do different schools within the, the district with two different elementary schools um so yeah i i don't want to i don't want to sort of say it as a cop-out but i i don't i don't see it as a 100 percent clear sort of quote-unquote win um it's 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 a benefit to some families and it's going to it could be potentially a hard you know a, a drawback or um disappointing for other families um and we have a policy that we did think through uh, and, and discussed originally how how we wanted to treat siblings and families within this program. Um, so I guess I, I don't really know what to say beyond that, but I, if we do decide as a committee to um, to make this change, 
I would ask that we also explore sort of what are the implications of make, of an allowing choice, if you will, for families whose students, um, who do have students that are split for all the same reasons that we're saying is a benefit to have um, the non-zoned, you know, non-Fort River zoned families sort of bump up in, in priority in the lottery. Um, just because it just doesn't sit well with me that we're going to make this decision for one program and not for others. Sorry, I muted myself right. <laughs> um, so I, I want to echo, I'm feeling very torn on this too. I don't have strong feelings. I think I, I also want to echo, I, it really feels uncomfortable to me to create a sibling preference and open up Fort River to siblings outside of the Fort River area for the Common Entities program and not for the students who are there for, for other reasons. Um, my other question is that if we were to change this policy, I'd want to build in something where we can go back and revisit it when we potentially have, depending on how the building project goes, it just feels like if your sibling, if we're going to have a school that potentially will have the Commonantes program in it and with different boundaries, it would feel weird to keep, if the decisions that were made now and the kids who got to end the program now defined who would have the potential to be in that program when we have a, a larger building um, potentially. I, so I get, I guess um, it seems easier to kind of stay with where we are at and not change, but at the same time, um, the only reason I can see for really switching over towards changing the policy is that for this program, I could see there being a real downside for us losing kids in the upper grades who are monolingual English speakers because those spots are not going to be easily filled in with like a fourth grader who's just joining Fort River. You can't do the lottery to have a fourth grade monolingual English speaker drop into the common entities program in the way that you could um, for other types of um, Dr. Morris? There's perhaps, and, and, and I'm, this is not something I thought about beforehand, uh, so I'm, I'm slightly loath to do this. But, you know, another way to maybe think about this is, you know, so, right, two to three kids outside the Fort River catchment area um, are in that group. The siblings, I think, are already prioritized within that lottery. Um, it might be interesting to see what our numbers are. This is not a way you define policy and just see if they're not necessarily taking the place of Fort River monolingual students, but they're rather almost getting uh, at the top of the lottery that would only apply to Crocker Farm and Wildwood families. Um, and whether that would be enough to, can't say a sure enrollment, but but, you know, not every kid is gonna have a younger sibling, right? Um, and so, or not every kid's gonna have a younger sibling two years younger or three years younger, right? And so, you know, I, it's not really resolving the, uh, the issue, but it, you know, I think there's sort of three options here. One is just no sibling preference whatsoever. Uh, the other is sibling preference, which is sort of what we have in the policy that sort of within groups, there's a sibling preference. Um, and, and then the last one is a sibling preference that sort of moves people between the four sets of groups you know the the spanish language background at fort river spanish language background not at fort river monolingual english at fort river and monolingual english outside of fort river so there's sort of sort of three scenarios one is no preference one is preference within band which is our current model and then one is preference you know and skipping bands so to speak so just i just wanted to mention that because i think just to broaden the conversation not to suggest one over the other but sort of there are three you know potential pathways to try to address this. I think that's why I was asking the questions about the numbers because there's there's the theory and then there's the reality and or in practice and it, I was curious as to really how many um, if there's two or three monolingual English students that have been able to get into the program, presumably if there's only one or two siblings in, in the non Fort River catchment areas, um, they're gonna get the priority there anyway um, with our current policy. Um, 
so the only question is if there's if all of the seats are filled with Fort River kids, then there's no no seats left for Mon anybody outside of the Fort River zone in Monterey. But, um, Mr. Harrington, do you have any thoughts or ideas that you want to weigh in on on this? Not anything specific. No, I'm I'm kind of pondering here a little bit. Uh, and so, I mean, I think, you know, and I know Ms. Lord isn't able to be on this call. I mean, I don't think it would throw us off if, if the committee wanted to come back in two weeks when we're doing the, the budget hearing at that meeting for Amherst, because we're not talking about doing this lottery. I think it's April 28th or something like that. It's late April. Uh, we'd certainly want to have it at the time of registration. And so that's, that's we'd, we'd want to get that feedback at uh, that next meeting so we can share it even if it's not codified by the time kindergartners, kindergartners register. But um, if the group wants more time to ponder and to, to think about it and have Ms. Lord involved, um, you know, we'd want, you know, some more clear direction at the next meeting. But I think it is a complicated issue. And I'm, I'm conflicted like everybody else, just to be clear. Like, you know, one of the reasons they make a recommendation is, uh, you know, our staff, our leadership team really uh, struggles with the same things that you all are struggling with, that we're empathetic. We see, you know, potentially some imbalance as it relates to special ed programs. We also see some advantage as it relates to siblings and ling linguistic students learning the same language and what that does in the home. Um, we see the concerns about what it does at Fort River. You know, we're also concerned about enrollment over time. And in, if we stay in our current model with three elementary schools, what does that do at Crocker Farm and Wildwood? If more students are coming to Fort River. So we have all, all the same concerns that were expressed this evening. Uh, and by concerns, I mean concerns with any of the potential solutions because they're all imperfect. Um, that's our world these days, isn't it? Um, so, um, you know, if the group wants more time to, to think about it, it's fine. We will really want to leave the next meeting in two weeks with, with, with a more firm direction, but uh, I don't want to put pressure on the committee to make a decision before it's ready to make a decision. I, I think that makes sense because it sounds like we all would would appreciate that a little bit of extra time, even if we think we know where we would go now. And I think it would be nice to enable Ms. Lord to be able to weigh in as well. Um, and so we'll just all commit that we come in with sort of more, you know, ha having thought about it over the next the course of the next two weeks so that we can give um, Dr. Morris and Ms. Richardson some clear direction. Okay, um, so uh, moving on to capital, and I'm going to text um, some of our uh, friends in uh, Union 26 that we um, are running a little late. So, yep. And uh, so the good news in terms of time is uh, Mr. Roy Clark uh, unfortunately can't be here tonight. So, Ms. Dr. Slaughter is filling in. So, what we said, uh, and I don't know if Dr. Slaughter knows this, but I checked in with Mr. Roy Clark later. We're gonna do a very quick summary of capital um, and we're gonna collect questions. Um, you can ask them here or you can email me afterwards and we'll make sure we respond to them both to the committee, but also bring them to the next meeting um, because there may be questions that, that you all ask that we, you know, if it's not in view of the public, we wanna make it visible to the public. Um, so I'm gonna ask Dr. Slaughter to do this very quickly given Mr. Roy Clark's um, conflict that um, unfortunately happened tonight. And we certainly can come back and talk about this in more detail uh, in two weeks, but I'll turn it over to Dr. Slaughter, who is wonderful, but is not Mr. Roy Clark. So uh, I want to just balance that he may ask questions and he may be a collector of them instead of being able to answer some of the nitty gritty important details on facilities. Right. Thank you. Um, so I had entirely uh, planned on being as brief as possible on this topic. So uh, nonetheless, what we put into your packet was was some uh, excerpts from the uh, the full capital plan that, that the uh, town finance directors put together. And so uh, I presented to you the the <clears throat> excuse me the full grid of the five year sort of plan, uh, partly just to give you context to what else is going on around town relative to that. Um, I'll start and and move to page two of this, uh, which is where the school lion's share of of the school uh, requests sit. Um, the vehicles will be on another page. I'll I'll get to those in a moment. But it, if you look across these, they're really largely focused on sort of health and safety and functionality of the buildings. Um, which is always the case, but at the same time, um, you know, the, the nature and age of our buildings is such that we need to continue to maintain them. 
Uh, the other difficulty that's not shown here is the fact that there are some really significant uh, infrastructure needs at Fort River and Wildwood because of the age of the buildings. And, you know, one of those buildings will probably, you know, uh, still be in existence and the town will still own it. And after a, a new elementary school building is built, uh, but, and, and so outside of the five-year window we're looking at, it's going to be some significant capital costs. Uh, they may not be school-related capital costs, though, depending on how, how the building project plays out. So I just want to give that context to, to sort of where this stuff sits. Um, but most of the things you'll see, uh, you know, roofing, electrical service upgrades, uh, security type upgrades are all related to keeping buildings functional and safe to be in uh, and trying to, to meet the needs of the students and, and, uh, and the staff as they try to execute a, a, a good program of study for students. Uh, you will see some things, um, you know, like our technology requests are, are there. That's the ongoing uh, replacement and refurbishment of, of equipment that we have and, and, and have experienced its high level of need this year for certain. Um, and so those are, those are there as well. But, but uh, you know, again, we have uh, the specific descriptions of these are on the latter pages. And so hopefully you had a chance to read through those. Um, you know, the... the there's a lot of parallels between the Fort River and Wildwood, uh, you know, uh, in, in what their needs are because they're similar age buildings. Um, I think at this point, I'll see if there's anything else I want to mention specifically about any particular project. I don't think there is. Um, and so I'll skip ahead to the vehicles. And the, and the circumstance with the vehicles for us is uh, there's a few in there. Um, <clears throat> there's a school bus. Uh, it's not specifically targeted to be electric. I know there's a lot of pressure in town to, to seek out electric school buses to date. And the the technology is just not quite there uh, to to support going in that direction. There, there are um, limitations on what it can and can't do, and what our needs are for a for a school bus. Uh, you know, don't mesh that well with with electric uh, as as it exists in the current day and, uh, day and time. Um, I don't think that that's a surprise to anyone. We've heard about that before, but I think that. Uh, it's not a, it is a direction I think we'd all like to go to. Um, I just think the technology is not quite there yet for us to, to replace several of our buses with electric buses. Um, the other thing you'll see is a couple of vans for special education. Uh, the two existing vans that we have are really uh, quite old and, and are in need of replacement. We have some requirements to, to meet the needs of, of some state regulation in that regard. Um, the one plow truck uh, is, is on there. Um, you know, the one we have is, is literally uh, Fairly functional, I think, this winter. Uh, in some ways, you know, the fact that we are 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 not in person during the the heart of the winter has actually been an advantage because that vehicle would not be as is not terribly reliable. Uh, to be perfectly blunt, uh, you know, it's it's not a hazard to the driver per se, but but nonetheless, as far as being functional for moving snow and that kind of thing, it's just really not very reliable at this point. So so beaten up and and used up. Um, and you know it'd be great to share you know a resource like that with the town, but when we need to plow, they need to plow, and so it's one of those circumstances where uh, the the need for those kind of vehicles are are simultaneous. Uh, so it gets difficult uh, to to leverage town uh, resources uh, in in that circumstance. Um, that being said, we also use that vehicle the rest of the year for other purposes and and, and maintenance and 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 uh, custodial work. So. So it does serve us a uh, benefit all year long, but but specifically around plowing snow, it it uh, timing wise uh, is at the same time the town needs to plow as well. So I think um, I'll stop at that point. I think I'll be that brief with with what it is and see if there are any particular items on this list. And and hopefully the descriptions below have sort of painted a bit of a picture for folks as to what they are. And, and I'll see if I can answer any questions anyone has. Mr. Dunley. Yeah, so just a couple of general comments for um, for you and Dr. Morris and, uh, and Mr. Roy Clark for when this is presented uh, to the town. One, you are definitely going to get questions on electric buses and electric, uh, and, and you'll, you will have to fill out that explanation and have a robust explanation for why it's all not going electric. Um, I'm not saying that that's a good or a bad thing, um, but, but you should expect it. And, and you know, you should expect to have a, a pretty Pretty good explanation for for why why going in this direction. Um, you know, a second is um, you know when we look at these five year fiscal year plans, in the back of our minds we're always like yeah yeah with year four and five it's like it's like hand waving that we're like estimating. I think in the particular 
scenario though where we you know where the uh the fort river building project is just ramped up and depending on what option happens fort river may be replaced if if that gets passed uh wildwood may also be replaced or they may not right and that has a massive impact at on that out year and i can't remember exactly what the timing is with the votes and whatnot whether that's fy25 fy26 so i don't think you have to put in doomsday numbers for if that doesn't happen. But I do think that when presenting any kind of five-year projection from this point forward, we do need to remind people in the community that those years get massively different if the building project goes a certain way. And we and there is, right now, we all hope, but, but there's no predicting that. So that's, that's just nothing. The, the other thing is, um, so I'm on JCPC with Ms. Spitzer. Um, and, you know, part of that is, you know, advocating for the schools and whatnot. So for the things that, that are on the initial draft, capital plan for the town. Is there anything not on it that you or Mr. Roy Clark or, or Dr. Morris are like, that should really, really be taken care of this year and you were really disappointed that it didn't get on the list? Something that we that we ought to be um, making some noise about. I would suggest that that there is not. Um, I think that, you know, in, in the conversations I've had today with Mr. Roy Clark and subsequently with the finance director of the town, you know, we kind of hashed through the, the the most urgent and most critical uh, needs and and we think that what we've put onto the list is is you know the highest priority, but also um, needing to be funded. Um, you know, if if anything, uh, you know, the, there's some some copiers in there, uh, and that ask. I, I don't think I would zero it out. Uh, it could be potentially reduced a little bit. That'd be the one area I think that might have a little bit of flex because we haven't been in the building, um, and so we're not using the copiers as as we normally would, and so that prolongs their life in some respects. Um, we may need to you know, move them around the building because some of the copiers are getting used as much as they ever have been, uh, but some are are not being used at all. They're just sitting. And so, uh, you know, that that is an area where we might have a little more flex, but um, I think otherwise, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty much the things that are on the list are things we really need. The one other thing I'll, I'll mention really quickly, uh, you know, to, to speak to those the Fort River and Wildwood buildings, they're both going to need a roof. Uh, that's, you know, three to five million dollars. That's literally setting in fiscal 27 is kind of, the, you know, if you want to sort of toss out a broad, I mean, there are other things that need addressing, but one of those two roofs will need to probably be replaced uh, plus or minus a year of that time frame. And if we keep both those buildings, they're going to be very, very expensive uh, in those fiscal 27, fiscal 28 to to maintain them as functional and appropriate school buildings if they if they remain uh, online as, as school buildings. Dr. Morris? Yeah, so two quick ones, because I know we're running short on time. One, um, I think one of the challenges, um, and I know this can be unsatisfying to some, is that our buildings in a typical year are occupied at least 10 months of the year. Crocker Farms occupied like 11 months of the year, or 11 and a half perhaps. So I think the limitation is, if you were saying, could, you know, if time was no object, if money was no object, could I come up with other things on here? Sure, I, you know, let's do all the accessibility stuff right now. I'm being quite serious. Like that would make a huge difference in the lives of children. It's just not practical. Um, and it's not not practical because it's not important. It's not practical because it's expensive. It's like literally, even if we had the money, one couldn't make those changes immediately and still have kids going to school in buildings. And so, I think just when we think about capital, that's just one of the things to keep in mind is that um, there are more things ideally that we'd like to do. And sometimes it's not just money that's the limiting factor. It's the fact that our buildings are occupied the vast majority of the year um, that, that creates a barrier. I think the only thing I, uh, and, and that particularly, I mean, accessibility comes up as, as, as a high point for me in terms of what I wish we could do that, that we probably can't, but uh, money is not the primary obstacle. It's just that a lot of that stuff involves um, kids not being there um, and adults not being there for a long period of time. So we are making efforts and progress on accessibility, but it, you know, I wish it would go faster. Um, but the, uh, the other thing I was going to mention um, is really to reiterate the point that you raised, Mr. Demling, and, and, and I know um, Terry did as well. You know, it's, if we knew the direction we were going in, in terms of the building project, it would really help us do some long-term planning. And so uh, that's, not a, that's not a push on people like Mr. Harrington, myself, who sit on that committee. Um, it's just, a, it's a reality that that process takes a while. Um, 
And once that decision is made and that fork in the road is traveled down, we'll be able to reassess what our needs are. But we sort of are in this, you know, purgatory place of waiting to see what happens. And then if it goes one way uh, and it looks like one of our schools won't be replaced for, for quite some time, uh, that list will grow. Um, so, you know, I just, I just want to note that, that um, that point can't be stated often enough. Um, and, um, you know, the roof is one great example that Dr. Slaughter mentioned, because it's, it's, it's an understandable uh, high dollar amount item that everyone can understand. We can't have a roof that leaks or has structural problems. Uh, but there's lots of smaller items that would need replacing uh, that they're smaller than a roof, but they're pretty expensive and, and cumbersome and hard to pull off. So, I, I, you know, I just I want to put that caveat in because I think it's really important. That's not pushing this building committee or the school committee to make a decision one way or the other. It's a real it's, it's a fact based comment about the future needs of a school, whether it's going to exist for four or five more years or 10 more years, will have a huge impact on the capital budget. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Spitzer. So I, I joined Mr. Demling on the JCPC, and I'm going to <laughs> reiterate this question about the electric buses. And, and it's not just, a, I mean, if we're talking about, it sounds like, I don't know if snow plows yet have electric technology. I'm assuming no, um, but it seems like the vans are the smallest vehicles. It, it, it may be useful to have at hand some of those estimates we had from last year about the cost of switching to um, an electric option. It, I, I remember last year, we I think when we put things out to bid, we got a quote from I forget which company responded with it, but it, I just think it would be useful to have at our fingertips the cost of pursuing an electric option because I have no doubt that that's going to come up. Um, and and I do think it's, a, and it's not that I disagree with the, I, I fully agree with the goal of trying to reduce our emissions as much as possible. And so it's potentially might be useful to also have, and I know this is the capital meeting and not like a green <laughs> committee meeting, but um, it may be useful to talk about um, some of the stuff we've been talking about related to start time um, conversations about when we um, are thinking about changing our routes to try to reduce emissions, just because I, th I think folks are going to want to hear that we are taking action related to this area. And to the extent that we are, I think we should highlight it. Um, I mean, they've created this new <laughs> thing in the JCPC, which I think is helpful. That's this green leaf that shows up next to projects. And I see that schools don't have a lot of green leaves. And that's not, not a negative thing to say, but um, I think it's it, it's clear to me that they're paying a lot of attention to it. And I think we need to be responsive to it um, to the degree that we can be. Um, and I'm thinking when I look at these out years kind of related to that conversation, like, do we want to think about like what is, I don't know what the useful life of a bus is, but at some point, um, you know, will it be a good idea to put in the cost of trying um, to green our fleet a little bit in terms of moving towards electric? And what would that cost? And I think if we have those numbers on hand, it would be helpful to either um, ask for the money we need to make it, uh, highlight the trade-offs that we'd have to make and whether or not those are trade-offs that folks would want to make. But I, I think this conversation is going to keep coming up over and over again. And to the extent we can have numbers and data to engage with it, it'll be useful. You guys know this, but I'm just I'm saying it again. Sorry. Thank you. Dr. Slaughter. If I may, just to, to give it a little uh, framing for this a little bit. So I noticed in, in the capital plan on the town side that the police vehicles are listed as hybrid this year. That question, I was on JCPC in 2008, and that question was posed, can we buy hybrid vehicles for police cars? This is the first time it's happened, which means that's how long it took the technology to get up to a place where it would function in that environment and that circumstance. Um, and and you know, people don't always know this about police cars. They have a tremendous uh, energy load by virtue of the, the, it's essentially a mobile office for the officers. Um, so I think we're sort of in the same place on the, on the, uh, on the, on the technology for the buses. Um, I also sit and work on uh, PBTA's uh, board. And so the conversation, and, and they're shifting, uh, you know, somewhat aggressively toward toward uh, more, uh, you know, fully bi hybridized or, or fully bu uh, electric buses. Um, 
The circumstance in which they operate are different. So it's kind of an apples and oranges comparison, but nonetheless, that technology is evolving quickly. So I can speak to that to some extent that it is. Um, and, and with that new technology that they're deploying, uh, even at the university, uh, that may be a potential uh, synergy that we could leverage, uh, you know, um, in, in that, you know, it's likely they'll put a fairly rapid charging station uh, on the university campus fairly soon, not immediately, but in, you know, in fairly short order. I think that's, that's a, a point we can make and potentially we can partner with the university to, to leverage that technology to help us out in, in, in using that green technology uh, for, our, for our school buses. Um, just to paint the picture though, uh, about 10 buses, uh, we buy a bus every other year, so that starts to give you a sense of how long they last. Um, which is a pretty long time, um, but I, you know, some of it's also about the demand. You know, if and and I think it's a balancing act between. Uh, so you know, if we want to take a field trip to Boston, you can't do that in an electric bus. The range of the bus is just not sufficient to get there and get back. Um, and so that doesn't mean you can't green your fleet to some extent, but you still have to then you know try to capture that circumstance of what's the cost. Uh, you know, what are the need to go to Boston or someplace for a field trip that that needs a a diesel powered bus or uh, you know or we contract that out and so those are the kind of the trade-offs we have there but I think you, you know to your point I think we'll I'll work with Mr. Roy Clark on, on trying to frame that a little bit to, to help uh, engender that conversation because I think we'd all like to move in that direction of, of, a, of a greener fleet there's no doubt about it um, I think one of the biggest things we can do uh, is to have more kids ride the bus um, the more kids that ride the bus and as opposed to having their parents drop them off and, and granted we're in a pandemic so that change the equation a little bit about other things. But I think in the, in the broader sense, the fuller our buses are, the, the, even if they're diesel, the much greener we are. Thank you. Um, so we're going to be coming back to this um, at, our, at our next Amherst meeting. Um, so unless there's a pressing question, that burning question that we wanna get answered right now, I'm gonna suggest we move on. Not seeing any. Okay, thank you. Um, I have to change my layout because again, I can't see everybody. Um, so, um, moving. Thank you, Dr. Slaughter, for joining us tonight. Um, moving on, we have um, our future agenda planning. And as we've stated a few times now, our next meeting, um, we have a joint meeting. Um, uh, next week on Tuesday, um, and then our next Amherst School Committee meeting alone is the 16th of March. Um, and on that agenda, tentatively we have right now, and I think this the planning document is in the packet. Um, so we have our budget hearing, um, and um, I should probably say it the other way, we'll be looking at ads and cuts um, for the FY22 budget. We'll be voting on school choice, We'll be talking more again about capital and we'll be aiming to have um, give clear direction on the coming on to sibling enrollment policy. Any anything um, new to add or questions? No. Okay. Um, I have one warrant to report. Um, so we'll be moving pretty quickly through this. Um, I authorized by my signature um, the payroll um, in the amount of $633,307.07, dated February 24th, 2021. And I signed that um, today, February 23rd, 2021. And that is all I have. Uh, if um, uh, our next item, I will make actually our final motion to adjourn the Amherst School Committee at 8.13 p.m. is our second. Second. Thank and you. we're going to a different meeting after this. Yes, and just for folks, um, we are um, joining a um, uh, the regional school committee and the Union 26 school committee in an executive session in a different Google Meet link. Um, so we'll exit and then re-enter. Um, so moved by McDonald and seconded by Demling. 
um, and we'll take a roll call vote. Um, Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. And McDonald, aye. Uh, so we will see you in just a few minutes over in the other room. <laughs>